A lot of landowners across Christchurch and across Canterbury are really perplexed about what's happened to their land following all the earthquakes we've been having over the last, since September of last year. We thought it'd be useful to try and explain about these land issues, to put together a, a DVD or a series of DVDs that gives explanations about what liquefaction is, about why your land might be green, why your land, why the land across the road might be red, to try and get, a, people give a fun, get people a fundamental understanding of these land issues. To put together these, um, these DVDs, we've used um, a guy called Dr. Jan Kupik, who's a, a PhD in geotech engineering, and he's, he's going to try and go through the issues in a way that hopefully gives people good explanations about what's been going on. This is what we think you want to know. It may not, may not answer all your questions, in which case let us know what else what else we should be putting in these videos. Um, send us an email or Twitter us and all those details are on the end of this DVD. This is going to be the first of a series. We want to make a whole lot of these, these DVDs, make giving explanations of these issues and the future ones we want to be answering your questions but also be trying to make them more area specific. So ones on different areas of the city so people can understand more about the geotech issues that actually apply to their particular areas. But give us your feedback, these are very much for you. Hello, I'm Dr. Jan Kupitz, I'm the geotechnical engineer and I'm working with Sierra at the moment. Now, I would like to discuss um, liquefaction and lateral spreading. And we will go into the field, namely into the Evenside Drive, and which is within the Evenside Loop, and it's a red zone. And we're gonna have a look, in this case, on lateral spreading. And then we go to Porrit Park, which um, has some fantastic examples of sandballs and uh, ground cracking. Let's go to Evenside Drive. Here we are in Evenside Drive to actually have a look at some examples of flatural spreading. Below me here are typical examples of flatural spreading. First of all, we have a displacement horizontally. And in this case, we have also some vertical component to the displacement. Now, over here we have example of about 200 millimeters movement and about 100 millimeters of vertical movement. Now, overall, the lateral displacement is continued from the river edge up to 100 meter land inwards. Quite often, it's not as pronounced as this crack visible over here, but can be much smaller as the crack next to me. Sometimes it's covered in grass and very often it's associated with actually material coming out of the ground, which is the sun boils and the mud volcanoes and the water you've seen in many areas in Avonside and Darlington around here. That's lateral spreading. Now let's look at the crust. The crust plays an important part in the performance of the land. The thicker the crust, the better performing the land is. So the distance between the liquefied layer to the surface is actually referred to as the crust. Now the crust can be seen over here where the water table is very similar to the river level. So if you look at cross there, one can actually see there is about two to up to two and a half meters of crust of material which hasn't liquefied and houses sit on top of this. We're here in the retreat road within the Avonside Loop. Just to describe locality, we have on one side red, on the other side orange zone, and further in distance a green zone. Now, the river runs via the Evenside Loop in this direction. Now, in this direction, the land was subject to lateral spreading and severe liquefaction, and hence was substantially damaged. And that's the reason it was zoned um, or, uh, red. On the other side, the assessment is still ongoing, and that's the reason it's actually orange. Whereas further down, the crust is becoming very important. There's a little rise in the land, actually indicating an old sand dune. The crust over there is much thicker and performs much better. Building on top of it, actually we're able to sustain much less damage than buildings within this area. We are here in Porrit Park to have a look at typical sand boils and another example of lateral spreading. Now, first of all, to the uh, sand boils. 
This is an example of a small to medium sized um, sun balls. These can be from very small up to about a foot in diameter up to several square meters um, in size. Now what happens after the earthquake there is a lot of pressure within the saturated ground and this pressure has to be relieved and generally if the crust is very thin as in this case it breaks open and the material comes under pressure jetting out and quite often it's in a linear fashion so you can see in this case there's about 20 meters where it came through a crack in the ground and actually the pressurized water carried with itself the sand and silt as you can see on the ground now this generally happened minutes after the earthquake and in some instances it actually continued to have water flowing out of it for several hours afterwards. Now, subsequently to that, the ground remained liquefied and the material actually spread sideways. So in this direction is a small water course and in this direction is the river. The material actually separated and that's where these cracks come into play. Now, this was a pre-existing crack from the liquefaction and this material then separated. And again over here we have about 200 millimeters of separation and this continues all the way up to the river edge. I'm just going to demonstrate right now material, solid soil can actually liquefy. What I have in my hands is nothing else but soil taken from a sun boil and added a bit of water to it. Now, I need to do two or three things. To soil to liquefy it. I need to induce seismic shaking like that and one can see it actually automatically turns to liquid and it can return back to solid ground and shaking and solid ground. Shaking, do another earthquake and solid ground. So three things need to happen. Shaking needs to occur. The material has to be a fine sand or a silt and it has to be full of water. If it's dry it does not liquefy. Hence material above the water table which is not saturated or full of water doesn't liquefy but material which actually is underneath the water table can liquefy very easily. Now a bit of myth busting over here. This material comes from a sand boil. What we see in the distance is a row of sand boils or in technical term, surface ejecta of materials. Liquefaction is actually a phenomenon happening at depth. And what we observe, and commonly termed liquefaction, is nothing else than actually its surface expression. The material which actually is being thrown out of the, from the depth to the surface, and that's actually sand boils. Let's talk about settlement. Settlement is actually when the land goes down. Now, some parts of Christchurch settled very little, some parts settled a lot, by up to 1.5 meters. Now, there are three components which contribute to the actually reduction in levels, i.e. the land getting down. The first one is tectonic settlements. And easiest is described, after the earthquake, one side of the fault line goes down and the estuary in the eastern suburbs settled between that much and that much, 50 to 100 millimeters. But conversely, what goes down, other bits have to come up. But the Banks Peninsula in that direction came up by about 400 millimeters. So parts of the Port Hills actually increased by about that much. So that's tectonic settlement. The land continued to move with every large earthquake. The second component I'm going to demonstrate over here with a bag of flowers. If we have loose soil, as we have in the Eastern Christchurch, which can be easily demonstrated with loose flour. It's actually susceptible to settlement, or in this case, volume reduction, or very simply speaking, it actually reduces in volume. So assume this was the land before the earthquake. With every earthquake, the volume decreases. Now, this has been ongoing, and this will be ongoing. So one can see right now how much it actually decreased in volume. So that's the second component of settlement. And the third component of settlement is, is the sand boils. 
the sun boils, which is the surface material coming on the surface, will actually be removed. The farmy army, the student army, the contractors came along and removed hundreds of thousands of cubic meters of material away onto a landfill site. Now this material would have stayed generally on the surface, but it's been removed. So we have right now three components. We have the tectonic settlement, we have the reduction of volume after a seismic event, as an earthquake, and then we have the material being removed away. And that contributes that some parts of Christchurch are right now much lower than they used to be. And one has to think about it, with more earthquakes to come, the land will continue to settle. Let's talk about liquefaction. Now, what is the definition actually of liquefaction? Now, the textbook said one of the most dramatic causes of damage to structures during earthquake is the occurrence of liquefaction in a saturated sand deposit. Loose sands tend to contract under cyclic loading imposed by the earthquake shaking, which can transfer stress from the sand matrix onto the poor water. If the soil is saturated and largely unable to drain the shaking, there is a problem. The result is a reduction in the effective confining stress within the soil and associated loss of strength and stiffness that contributes to the deformations of the soil deposit. Well, obviously, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? And let's actually demonstrate it on a cake. Very simply, the liquefied soil is actually the cream layer. And the crust, which often is referred to as the non-liquefied material above the water table, is actually the cake and the topping and the material at depth is actually the cake again. So very similar, we have a layer which liquefied and we have a layer which hasn't liquefied. Now in order to create this layer, as the textbook said, I need shaking from an earthquake, I need to have the right soil type, which we'll see later in the field, and I need uh, water in it. Now, as one can see, that's liquefaction. Now what happens if I have actually a free edge, i.e. just imagine there is a river over here and it's coincidental, and that is lateral spreading. Okay, liquefaction is generally not what ends up in people's backyards on the streets. Liquefaction is an effect at depth and liquefaction in this cake is actually the cream in the middle of the layer. Now, what most people refer to as liquefaction is actually the sun boils at the end. Now, if I pressurize this layer by squeezing on it, I should actually have over here a sand boil, a squirting of liquefaction. Let's have a look at this. That actually was the effect of sand boils developed from a depth. So what you find in your backyard and on the street is actually the surface ejector, which is technically called. So that's the sand which actually ends up on being removed later on. Jan, there are three questions that a lot of people keep asking us and we're wondering if you can give us the answers. And that is, is the land under my house still all soft? Will it keep sinking? And how long does it take the liquefaction to go away? Yeah. Thanks, Jan. Now, what we have seen in um, this video is that liquefaction is actually a layer of soil that liquefied. And that generally happens during the earthquake, but it will take some days, some weeks, and in some instances actually up to months uh, before that layer, which is a semi-liquid state, actually returns back to solid ground. Okay? Now, the last earthquake was 13th of June, which occurred, of course, significant liquefaction. So right now, being August, I would not expect anymore that the land is liquefied um, anymore underneath the people's houses. Now, so to answer your question, no, it's not any more soft. How long it will take away it uh, before it goes away? Well, you know, it depends on um, the area where you are and the permeability of the soil. So it's something to do with the soil properties. But it can take, as I said, several hours, up to several months. And will it keep sinking? Well, that's a question for future proofing. Now, with every seismic event of similar sizes as we had, it will keep sinking. Okay? And that's one of the reasons why we put liquefaction mitigation measures in place. So if you have a settlement of 100 millimeters in February and 100 millimeters in January, uh, sorry, in June, you will get similar amount of settlement in subsequent events.